Coming up on today's show, Elon settles and we all move on. Profitability is nigh and the community comes together for Tesla. Japanese brands lead the British EV surge. And some insight into the Audi e-tron's most innovative feature. Well, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to EV News Daily. It's Monday, the 1st of October 2018. It's Martin Lee here, and I've been through every EV story today, so you don't have to. Thank you to the team at myev.com for helping to make this show. Well, they've built the first marketplace specifically for electric vehicles. You know, it's totally free to go on there and to use. If you want to buy and sell, learn about and research EVs, check out myev.com. Well, after saying over the weekend that I wouldn't comment on ongoing legal action because of several reasons. Firstly, everybody else was having their say on Elon Musk's uh, busy few days last week. But also, it became a legal matter. And and then you don't need me chipping in to those kind of things. Well, that didn't last long. It's all over. Elon Musk's fallout with the SEC about funding secured is all over. And both both parties have agreed to settle the lawsuit. The SEC has agreed on the settlement, which makes clear Elon Musk doesn't have any suggestion of doing anything guilty, level level at him uh, whatsoever. Elon Musk is currently chairman and CEO, but he has agreed to hand over the reins of the chairmanship to somebody else within 45 days. There's a $20 million fine, which I've seen some people online today saying that he won't even notice that as a billionaire. Well, that may be so, but 20 million is 20 million in anyone's currency. It's a lot of money. And Tesla, as an organization, has agreed to pay 20 million as well for their part in whatever their part was, not controlling him or something. Uh, once three years has passed, Elon Musk can once again be re elected as chairman, uh, should the company wish. It's I should make clear, he stays on the board of directors, by the way. I saw some initial articles and people tweeting straight away going, Elon's off the board, but he's going to be CEO. And it's like, no, he's got a place on the board. It's just the chairmanship. And you see why they're big. The SEC just want a little bit more. Uh, diversity of voices, perhaps, may be used for checks and balances, perhaps. So, uh, there's going to be two independent directors appointed to the board of Tesla, and one of the strangest conditions of the settlement is a line that a new independent committee of directors is going to be put in place, and they will control Elon's communications. And they talk about things like social media, blogs, other things as well. Uh, There's a line in the settlement about pre-approved permission before Elon tweets anything that's material to the company. So I guess there's going to be some working out now of what's material to the company and what's Elon saying, hey, we smashed it in the quarter or uh, things are great or we've just developed a brand new bit of software and it's going to be rolling out this week. Is that material to the company or is that the kind of stuff that he would be tweeting? The one the one thing we don't want out of this whole situation is for him to have to back off those announcements on Twitter because it's like uh, unlike any other car company CEO, he talks to his his fans, the company's fans, his customers, and he can see a tweet sometimes from someone saying, I'm having a really bad time with delivery and it's not, and he'll get involved and go, right, leave it up to me, I'm going to get, get this sorted. And that is incredible. One of the many reasons why people have been doing what they've been doing this weekend. I'll get onto that in just a moment. Uh, so my take on this is the perfect, so it's the perfect solution to a hastily sent tweet, which in hindsight, okay, maybe wasn't the best. However, would he have won the case? Yeah, probably, uh, if he could have proved that funding was secured. The story would have rumbled on for months, and he lawyered up, and then the SEC have their legal team, and it would have gone on for so long, maybe even years. This thing, these things can get dragged out for. So I think it's fantastic that we have a solution within a couple of days, and the main reason I'm excited is today. Today is the first day of a new quarter, and that means Q3 numbers are now locked. They're carved in stone as of midnight last night. And we're going to get onto that in a moment, but this story has the potential to overshadow any other good news that came out of the company uh, for months, if not years. Like I say, with any legal case, you never quite know which way it's going to end up, even if you're confident that you're going to win. And it would have just dominated every Tesla story for such a long time. Every story would have been prefaced with this whole currently going through legal action thing, and it would have taken so much attention away from the incredible work 
that, that tens of thousands of people are doing for the company. And so I'm dead pleased about that. Let's move on to what I was talking about. Profitability is nigh and the community has been coming together. Well, Elon's told uh, Tesla employees over the weekend the company was on the cusp of making money just hours after he and the car maker had reached a settlement uh, with the SEC that steps up oversight of his communications, reports Fortune. Sunday marks the end of the third quarter, and Tesla has frantically pushed to boost deliveries before the period ends. So Elon sent this communication to staff, and I quote, We are very close to achieving profitability and proving the naysayers wrong, but to be certain, we must execute really well tomorrow. That is a Sunday he was talking about. If we go all out tomorrow, we will achieve an epic victory beyond all expectations. So I think he sent out that communication knowing that they've smashed it. Because if you were just within a few hundred or a few thousand, actually maybe not a few thousand, but maybe a few hundred, I don't know if you'd sound so confident in that. But he sounds uber confident in that in that uh, email to staff. And he says, if we go all out tomorrow, we'll achieve an epic victory. Well, I think he knows they've achieved a victory, but he really wanted to smash it. Who wants to be, if they did it by one, if they're profitable by a dollar, but if they beat it by one, there'll always be people going, oh, well, you can't sustain it. So I think that note was more about, more about, come on, let's really go for it. And let's not just, let us not just achieve our guidance, let's smash it. Well, meanwhile, uh, Simon at Tesla Rati has been noting the, uh, noticing the same thing that I noticed over the weekend. And I was reposting and retweeting as many people as I could find online about volunteering based on social media activity from members of the Tesla community. Uh, Simon says it appears the company's volunteer-boosted delivery initiative continues to be really strong. While volunteer Model S and 3 and X owners can't do the paperwork, the assistance they provide to new owners is invaluable, uh, perfectly captured in a picture uh, shared by the um, Northern Texas, I think that is, Tesla Owners Group on Twitter, depicted every volunteer helping new owners download the Tesla app, even before... They were checked in. I saw so many people from all over. I saw some posts from Oregon, some Ontario uh, posts, big deliveries in Canada. I saw some people saying that 250 deliveries were due in some service centers, some delivery centers. It's just an amazing weekend. They've made all of these cars, and now they're in the hands of people. And what is just, what's just awesome is that every single car that they make and whether they smash it or whether they beat it by one, every single car they make and sell and deliver is one combustion car that isn't on our roads. And that is incredible. Well done, everybody at Tesla. Can't wait to hear now. I was saying over the weekend we could get to hear pretty soon. And uh, one of my favourite journalists to follow on Twitter is Dana Hull from Bloomberg. And always very, or I think always very balanced. Uh, always puts out the negative stories. The critic, it's not negative, but will criticise when she feels Tesla need to be hauled up on something um, and also will compliment them when she, I think she's very fair. And of course, that means you're either upsetting the Tesla fanboys or up, up, upsetting uh, the other lot. So she replied to me over the weekend on Twitter and said, actually expect the earnings call early November and we might not hear anything until then. I've seen other people on Twitter saying, maybe even today, by the time you hear this, they've put out preliminary figures. So we'll be on the lookout. We can't wait to see those figures. Well, the ongoing strength of the automotive relationship between the UK and Japan was highlighted today by the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, the SMMT, at the 31st e Electric Vehicle Symposium, the world's largest electric mobility expo in Kobe in Japan. The latest figures from the UK trade body uh, showed that about 6 out of 10 hybrid and plug-in and pure BEVs registered here in Great Britain had a Japanese badge on them, 59.5% to be precise. Uh, demand is up by a fifth over the last year. Models enjoying particular growth because they do lump everything into this that has a battery, no matter how small, whether it has a plug or not. The Toyota Yaris does well. The Lexus does well. Uh, the um, the Toyota Prius uh, does very well. Uh, there are hybrids. Uh, the Nissan Leaf, of course, does have a plug on it, and it's manufactured in the UK in Sunderland. We're very proud of that. For all of Europe, it was the UK's market-leading pure electric vehicle, accounting for more than two-fifths of all registrations. Well, three more stories to go today. 
And this is an interesting question to pose uh, on the on the day that we move on to a brand new quarter. It's all about Model 3. Clean Technica start to talk about Model Y. And maybe the Model Y will be the Tesla killer killer. Bear with me on this. Those who follow me on Twitter know I love to retweet anything that calls a car a Tesla killer. If I can find that headline, I'm retweeting it because it's the most ridiculous phrase ever. Uh, in the last few months, I've been retweeting pretty much non-stop articles about the iPace being a Tesla killer, the Audi e-tron Quattro being a Tesla killer, the Mercedes EQC being a Tesla killer. None of those three cars are going to destroy a company worth $45 billion. However, they're all lovely cars in their own right. I just don't know why when they release a car, they have to be at the detriment to Tesla. Even the Hyundai Kona I've seen called a Tesla killer. Uh, once again, the mainstream media. Look at a car, and a car has batteries. Therefore, ergo, they all must be competitive with, with each other. So a Hyundai Kona, which costs 35000 can be compared by, in some articles with a Tesla Model X, a seven-seat SUV, for $150,000. But batteries, they've both got them. It's enormously frustrating, but we've come to expect it, which is why I love to retweet those Tesla killer articles. Now, Clean Technica asks, is the Model Y the Tesla killer killer? <laughs> and I really like that. Uh, one of the key points they talk about, actually, is scale. Model 3 scale is insane already. Maybe fifty to 55,000 Model 3s made this quarter in Q3. And the Model Y is going to be on a bigger scale. There's a car which will directly go up against those cars that I've just talked about. The I-Pace, the e-tron Quattro, the Mercedes EQC. And it, when it, we get it, the uh, BMW iX3. But the thing is about the Model Y, because of scale, that'll be produced twenty dollars to $30,000 cheaper than those cars are on sale at the moment. No, I'm not saying that those manufacturers might not lower the price over time, or they might want to prove to their own shareholders, because kind of people forget that all these other German automakers have their own issues and shareholders that some of them are quite upset at the moment still. And also, they want value. They want to know that they're selling their EVs at a profit. And if you're only making a thousand of them here and a thousand of them there, the price has to be so much higher to make a profit, to even break even. You ask Tesla, 10 years ago. Well, one of, the, uh, one of the things that perhaps is a difference in the USA, I see the Model Y really doing very well against those cars. Here in Europe, and it always it's funny when I talk to my US listeners, comment on YouTube and go, oh, I can't believe that sometimes you defend VW and... and <laughs> I get the strength of feeling against them. But here in Europe, maybe it's the history thing, maybe that we're proud that over the years they've made great cars. There really still is a lot of fondness for Daimler and VW and BMW. And yes, we know that Volkswagen have done some morally questionable diesel antics. And I don't mean to play it down by using a, like a phrase like antics. We know what they did was a, a terrible thing. Maybe it won't be such an easy win for Tesla here in Europe. Maybe that's the only difference that I can see at the moment, but it's a, a keen thing that we'll be following. Well, let's talk about the Audi and the Audi e-tron Quattro rear cameras, one of the most innovative features of the entire car. Been getting loads of press and headlines in case you thought the Audi engineers had been staying up all night, burning the midnight oil, if you like, to design these new wing mirrors, which are cameras. Well, nah, you'd be wrong. They actually come from a Spanish company. Uh, they're called Ficosa, and they've been talking about it. They said that they are the ones behind the rear view camera system, which is going to be fitted to markets where regulations permit, like Europe. Sorry, America, you get the bog standard mirrors until you can change the rules. The cameras are made in Spain. The wings which support them are actually made in Germany, and in total, 90 engineers have been working on things like advanced optics and software. Right, here are the nerdy bits. The system's known as a CMS, the camera monitoring system, and it's made up of a rear-facing camera where the wing mirror should be on little stubby little bits that stick out, and the touch screens are just inside the door, so your eye falls naturally to them. Seven-inch OLED displays on the inside of the doors. All very clever stuff. Javier Puyol is a CEO of Ficosa, and he said this, and I quote, rear-view systems are Ficosa's core business business. So being the first to launch a CMS to the European markets, a turning point in our technological transformation process. In this way, we've not only proven our ability to take advantage of our know-how 
in vision, but we've also blazed the trail, being the first to reach this accomplishment that will revolutionise the automotive industry. It's an honour for Ficosa that Audi, one of the most renowned automobile manufacturers in the world, has trusted our expertise in vision to develop and manufacture this solution, end quote. Well, the benefits to them are obviously reduced drag and you even see concept cars without wing mirrors for instance because they don't look great you see them as little stubby cameras sometimes this is the first time it's actually gone into production as far as i know at scale so reduced drag is the holy grail for evs but also the cameras are very clever they remove the blind spots they increase the field of vision and that changes at speed so when you're going slowly you might want to have a wider field of vision because you want to be maneuvering but at 70 miles an hour on the highway you don't need to see quite so much and it narrows uh, just for the cars that are overtaking you and they're more reliable at night because they don't glare and yes they do have sensors in them so that if the cameras get dirty blocked for some reason it tells you to clean them well, finally, I've been talking so much about Tesla's version 9 software recently that uh, we need to give some love to the app. Uh, there's been an app update. Firstly, uh, third-party map apps can now be shared. You can plan your route on Google Maps, my personal weapon of choice, and then send it to your car. Next up, you can remotely start updates from your app and initiate them. So you haven't got to go to your car to initiate the update uh, when you have a, an over-the-air update for the operating system, which is useful. Maybe, I'm thinking out loud maybe that's useful if you don't spend a lot of time with your car why wouldn't you spend be spending time with your car if you use it for car sharing if it's never really you own a car but it's never really where you are maybe it's remotely locked and unlocked remotely even monitored well that's certainly something that i think tesla have got a long-term thought about in terms of fleets of self-driving cars and finally media control for passengers i love this uh, passengers can use their mobile phone and they've got a nice little remote control on their phone screen to change the tracks the volume and things like that quick update on uh, i've had a couple of emails saying what's your situation with uh, buying your wife uh, her new ev we've had a, a a week of kind of going backwards and forwards she decided on the renault zoe was it going to be a new one or was it going to be a used one? And the, so the new one, benefits of that, 40 kilowatt hour on the ZE40 battery means it's a car that is just just usable. I mean, uh, her parents are an hour away. Yes, I live an hour away from my mother-in-law. Uh, her parents are an hour away. It's a 120 mile round trip and on the ZE40, no problem. It wouldn't touch the sides. And so that is extra utility, and but it's many, many, many thousands of pounds so the i think the recommended price from renault is a almost nineteen thousand pounds on the battery lease one get that cheaper of course with discounts however and i know this this doesn't make me very typical to most people we always buy our cars in cash we don't have fifteen thousand pounds in cash to buy a car we've never got into finance and i know most people do buy their cars that way so i'm not it's not like i'm kind of some you know oh you should do it my way we, we're just that's just like how we're wired so so we have to do what we've got the cash to do, right? And that means a a used Zoe with the small battery, which is still fine. So that's 80 to 100 real world miles. And, and that means that we can do what we always do, which is just buy our cars in cash. And uh, we always drive very modest cars because of that. So we never have these gorgeous cars sitting in the driveway. But yeah, we also never have payments. And so, you know, pros and cons. But uh, I've got a couple of emails to send uh, today on Monday. Uh, I think we're there, actually. So that'll be super exciting. Uh, I think the one that she's found that she likes the most is a bit of a journey from where I'm recording this and where we live. So, two options. Put it on the back of a trailer and get it shipped down. Uh, that'll be a diesel truck that would bring it down, so I'm not happy about that. The other option is, I'll go get it. So, I may be jumping on the train sometime soon. If I do that, I'll make sure I film it for a YouTube special or something, just so that you can <laughs> you can see the lengths <laughs> that I will go to. But I'll fill you in. If the deal comes off, I'll fill you in. I promise, I promise. Right, let's get on to the community section of today's podcast. I set a new question yesterday. If you haven't got up with the weekend podcasts yet, some brilliant comments for question of the week yesterday on Sunday. Please download that. Uh, please add it to your, uh, your queue of things to listen to. So, we set a brand new question yesterday. Here it is. It's a simple question. I want you to answer on email or on the comment section of YouTube. Uh, and actually on the blog has a feedback form, three ways to do it that way. Here's the question. Plug-in hybrid or pure electric? And that's it. It's a simple question this week. Plug-in hybrid or pure electric? Which should you buy 
Then which did you buy? Is range a concern? Maybe not enough selection in either of those segments for choice. And you couldn't get the car you wanted, so you had to get uh, one or the other. Let me know what people should be doing, what you did, maybe. In an ideal world, what would you have done? Plug-in hybrid or pure EV? And I look forward to seeing your comments. I really want to hear from you. Thank you to the 88 patrons of the podcast. Uh, Thank you to you. We get to make this show. Uh, There are 251 episodes online for free to download. The blog's evnewsdaily.com. If you want to hang out on the socials, just search for me. You'll find me. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow.